Hello, welcome. My name is Daniel Cho. I'm the minister at Rosedale Presbyterian Church here in downtown Toronto. And I'd like to welcome all of you to our first installment of these conversations that we are having uh, here at Rosedale Presbyterian Church. And uh, I want to introduce our first guest. Welcome, the Reverend Dr. Robert Ferris, the moderator of the 147th General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church in Canada. We're really glad to have you. Uh, this is sort of a get to know the moderator opportunity. Uh, so for our Presbyterian constituency across Canada, a chance to hear your story, learn about your experiences, uh, hear what you have to share with us uh, in the Presbyterian Church in Canada. So welcome, Bob. Uh, first of all, uh, how has it been going so far uh, in these new moderatorial shoes? It's been fun. That's the word I'm using most often. Uh, I've, I've really enjoyed my time as moderator. The meeting itself was very intense and uh, uh, some challenges for me in terms of it being online and right. how we handled that and how the meeting went. But in general, that's the word I'm using, is fun. It's great to meet people in different churches in different parts of the country get to know the church a little bit better, have people meet me, know me a little better, and together think about where, where we're at and where we're going as a church. Wonderful. Uh, so this is about the five month mark, four or five month yes, mark as would be. moderator. Mm -hmm. And you still have your energy with you. It's still, it's still fun. I'm, I must say I'm having to check myself a little more uh, these days. Uh, our church doesn't have a full-time position for moderator, so I'm still half-time in my day job as associate minister at St. Andrew's Church, and uh, then half-time approximately with work related to the assembly. What I'm finding, it's becoming more like 70%, 70% time, so it's, there's lots to do, and I just have to be careful about uh, how much is on my plate. And possibly even 100% and 100%. Yes, yeah. some days it feels like that. Absolutely, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, as I said, this is an opportunity for our Presbyterian constituency to get to know the moderator. So I'd like to ask you an initial question. Who is Bob Ferris? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. I'm glad you said Bob Ferris. I've, I've been hearing the Reverend Dr. Robert Ferris, and I'm not used to that, and I... I'm only used to calling you Bob. I know, I know, and that's how I respond to people uh, uh, through my name, and that's the name I've, I've used for most of my life. Uh, I grew up in Newmarket, and when I hear anybody call me Bobby, I know it's from those days in, mm -hmm. in Newmarket, mm -hmm. but uh, moved to Sarnia when I was 12, and then I became Bob, and I've been Bob ever since. Well, you may start a trend now with Bobby. I could, I could. Um, that's, it's a very good question, and I've often thought about who Bob is, who I am as a person, and uh, identity, of course, is a very big question for us. I, I'm a a Presbyterian from birth, um, but I would say to start with, I'm, I'm a child of God, I'm a human being, uh, I have a particular set of experiences in my life that have made me who I am. Some of them are very joyous and I hope we'll be able to talk a little bit about that. Some of them have been more challenging and perhaps that's what people think about more when they think about me, especially the work that I've done in relation to inclusion of LGBTQI people in the church. Um, I'm a person who loves life. The older I get, the more I realized, A, how privileged I've been, and B, how interesting and exciting my life has been. And, and I give thanks to God for that, and uh, to all the people who have been part of my journey along the way. 
Now, certainly being moderator has a definite impact on your identity, your sense of calling and, and ministry. Uh, you have been, well, you are a minister, you have been a missionary, you've been a, a teacher, mm -hmm. a university teacher, uh, and now the moderator of the church. How have you come to faith? How did you get here? And how do you see this whole process, this personal journey? Uh, can you describe for us your faith journey? What, what, what was that beginning like for you? Well, as I said, I, I, was, I feel like I was born in the Presbyterian Church. I was certainly baptized as an infant uh, and grew up in, uh, in St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church in Newmarket, Ontario. So the church has always been part of my life, and faith, I would say, has also been part of my life. My family was deeply committed to the church, and so I was there every Sunday. I was thinking the other day about people who have had an influence in my life, and I, I, and I was in a situation where, we're, where we were asked to recall someone who helped you in terms of bringing you to faith. And I remembered a Sunday school teacher whose name was Helen Mark. She was the uh, widow, actually, of the minister who had been in the congregation who had died while he was there. And she was, was my Sunday school teacher. And I, I wanted to look after her because I knew she'd gone through a difficult time. But she's one of the people who first told me that Jesus loves me. Mm. And for me, that's central to who I am as a person of faith. Those words that I heard as a child have been extremely important to me throughout my whole life. And there have been times when, both in the church and in society, uh, that affirmation has not felt to be true, or that there are those who, who would not affirm that because of who they think I am, or that I don't merit that, or don't merit it in the same way that others do. But I would say right from that very early age, I learned that Jesus loves me. I think Karl Barth said something about that too, That's right. uh, about how important that is. Uh, but as, as I have gone on in my life, that's also been very important. I had an experience, um, I don't know how old I would have been, probably in my 30s, when I was feeling very down and very far from God and very far from feeling like a beloved person. And I went out for a walk uh, at night and it was in the winter, and um, I was at my parents' place. They'd retired by that point, and it was at a beach up near Wasega Beach. And I was trying to figure out what faith was all about. And, and part of that was why I even stayed in the church, why I was doing what I was doing, why I felt called into this particular life and ministry. And in my head, I began this almost mantra that God is love and love is God. And I kept repeating that as I walked uh, that night. And somehow that brought me peace. Somehow that affirmed that very early those very early words that I had heard, it affirmed who I was, and it let me know that it wasn't what others said about me or thought about me or believed about me and others. It's rather faith is about that affirmation that no matter what, God loves us. God is love and love is God. Did some of the ways that people have um, perceived you, did that have a negative impact on, on your faith, on your understanding of 
who you were or mm -hmm. understanding of how God sees you. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. I think most of that was hidden because mm -hmm. as a gay man, I was in the closet uh, and particularly deep in the closet while I was in the church. So it was hard to express or to allow any of that to be articulated mm -hmm. in, in the church. Mm -hmm. But in my own mind, in my own self, there were many struggles around uh, how, how I could believe in this God who is love, who then put me in a situation where I couldn't be who I was, I couldn't say who I was in the community that, that was my community, that was my beloved community, but somehow I couldn't be that person who I knew I was, who God knew who I was, but I couldn't let others know that because I was afraid. And uh, I think that that experience on that walk was where I learned that I didn't have to be afraid. It took time from then to begin the what in the in the gay world is called coming out or the LGBTQI world coming out, the experience that most of us go through in revealing to others who we really are. But that was foundational to my ability to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, it was based in my, my faith and my faith that God loved me and that God is love. You said that you felt the message of God saying, fear not. Mm -hmm. uh, that reminds me of a quote, I don't recall who said it, but it's, it goes like, whenever you hear fear not, get ready because there's a big job coming. <laughs> yes. So from that experience, from that point, did you feel that there was a big job coming? There's, there's, mm -hmm. there's a calling now, now that you felt the sense of new affirmation, perhaps liberation, Yes. Did you feel a new job, a big job coming? Mm -hmm. Just on your point about fear not, it's, you know, angels always say that in the Bible right. when they come to somebody and they say fear not, but there's usually something they should be really afraid of because, as you say, there's a big calling, there's mm -hmm. a big job ahead of them to do. And yes, yes, I would say I, I had that, that sense and as I moved along the, the process of coming out, that became more and more apparent that uh, remaining in the church and being more and more out as a gay man meant that I had a role to play, not only for myself and my relationship with others in the church and in the broader world, but also for others who were still afraid and who uh, didn't know how how to overcome that barrier, and and so uh, just another experience that when I heard the news about um, Daryl McDonald when when the General Assembly had overturned his call and his uh, call to uh, to ordained ministry, um, I knew at that moment I had to make a decision whether I would stay in the church or whether, and, and, and be an advocate for inclusion and, and myself be out more and more out, or I had to leave. I, 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 there, that was a, a very decisive point in my life as well. And when I made the decision that I was going to stay, then I knew that there was a calling, there was a role um, for me, al along with many others, and I'm not taking that all on myself, but I became part of what was called a new network, which was a small group within the Presbyterian Church that was um, advocating for fuller inclusion of people who were LGBTQI, um, and very much behind the scenes and trying to find the way at that point. That would be in the late 90s, early 2000s. But I knew that I had a role to play. 
and I, as in many parts of my life, I seem to become a leader uh, and, and to be up front and center in many different situations. And that just grew over, over the years. Yes. Certainly. And uh, you've had a, a very prominent voice uh, with regard to the Rainbow Communion, yes. um, that whole project, that whole mm -hmm. process. Could you speak a little bit about that? Mm -hmm. it, uh, I don't know whether uh, uh, people know this or, or how well people know the structure of the church, but it was within the Committee on Church Doctrine that, that we first talked about uh, Rainbow Communion and a, a pastoral response rather than a strictly doctrinal response to the question of inclusion. Um, and to, to look at uh, the harm that has been done to LGBTQI people and, and others over the years. And it emerged out of what, what was written in the report on human sexuality from 1994, which was the church did have an obligation to repent of its homophobia and hypocrisy in relation to people who identified as, as gay or as LGBTQI. Gay was the word that was used at the time. Um, so in the first place, I was actually reluctant to say that that was a good idea mm. because I wondered how the church could be pastoral while still maintaining in its doctrine and its practice a very exclusive uh, understanding and approach to people who, who identified as LGBTQI. But um, uh, the, the, um, the motion, the recommendation passed and the, the proposal moved forward and it went to General Assembly and so it was the special committee re-LGBTQI and I found myself again uh, being asked to be in a leader's leadership role and I was eternally grateful that uh, Sue Senior, an elder in Knox Waterloo, agreed also to be a co-convener because we were being called to be out in that position. Uh, and that's maybe to say one more step along the way of the whole process that I went through of being out in the church. And how and was that for you? The, was that something that you felt, well, you, you, mm -hmm. it, it happened, you yes. did it. Yes, um, yes. Can you describe that yes. decision moving yeah. forward in that process? Yeah. Well, again, it was one more step. So I had been out uh, in my congregation. I had been, uh, but I was very careful before that, generally in public, not to disclose my gay identity. With that step, I knew that I had to be out. There was no hiding anymore. And Sue and I talked about it and talked with others because um, the church was actually um, pushing us to be, it was an outing experience because uh, on the positive side, the church was saying, there have to be at least two members of this committee who identify as LGBTQI because we're not just talking about people, we want people who, who identify as part of the committee. But on the other hand, it put anyone who was ordained, either to Ministry of Word and Sacraments or as an elder, uh, to declare who they were and put themselves at odds with what the doctrine and the polity of the church was at the time. So. Um, I had to think about that. I had to discern whether that was where I wanted to go. And I, but at that time, it seemed the right step. And, and again, not only for myself, but for others. I felt uh, it was important for someone to, to say, here I am, this is who I am. 
and uh, and and that was really at the heart of the work of the Rainbow Communion, as it became known. It was about hearing the stories of of people, real people, within our church, who had been harmed because of uh, homophobia, hypocrisy, transphobia, and uh, heterosexism were the terms that were used. And and to me, that's what is so important in all of the, the work and the process of inclusion in the church is that it's about real people and it's about relationships. I've often said, I, I've, I don't think I've ever changed anyone's mind about inclusion or about the, the full humanity of people who identify as LGBTQI in a, in a debate about doctrine. Mm -hmm. um, it, in that case, it's two positions and you're the positives and the negatives and the pros and cons. And, but to be in relationship with someone, to be a member of the church with someone, to be a friend, or, or to recognize in your family or among your co-workers that there's someone who's very human, who happens to identify as LGBTQI, and is also someone you, you like or you love. Uh, so it's not, it's not a doctrinal or a legal proposition anymore. It's about human beings and about relationships. And I think that was where Rainbow Communion really moved our church. We had to hear real stories of real people who were connected with all sorts of other people in the church. And so uh, we came to the conclusion we have to stop harming people who are our friends. Some people may, there may be several folks uh, who may not be aware, but the Rainbow Communion produced a video and it was yes. shown, I guess, for the first time at a past General Assembly right. in, in 2019, I believe. Yes, the last in And person. It, is, it is very powerful, mm -hmm. it's very riveting, and I, I want to highlight what you said. These are stories, real stories, from our Presbyterian Church. Yes. They're not people from way out there, mm -hmm. far from us. These are people within our own church that have gone through this. Mm -hmm. and have been courageous enough to speak with you, the Rainbow Communion, mm -hmm. and to share their story. Yes. And, and uh, the impact has been tremendous throughout our denomination. Mm -hmm. uh, and it has contributed to where we are today. Mm -hmm. And uh, you've had a significant role uh, in that. Mm -hmm. But again, these are real, yes. real stories. Yes. You know? Yeah. I think again in, in the, the experience I've had in my life, and that's getting to be quite a few years now, is that often people, and it's not just with LGBTQI people, it's with any, any particular group, but as long as we can say they're out there, they're, they're that group that's out there, and they, we may feel that they pose a threat to us or that they're different from us or that they challenge us in some way. But when we find out that no, <laughs> um, we share together in, in the church, in the body of Christ, uh, we share at the communion table. It's about relationships. It's about relationships. Reconciliation. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned earlier that you were considering leaving the church, leaving the mm -hmm. Presbyterian church at least. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's gone through quite a number of stages. Yes. Obviously, ostensibly. Mm -hmm. um, now, with regard to the final decisions that the General Assembly has come to, that's also gone through different emanations. Uh, there was a period where we had voted, we had approved full inclusion mm -hmm. and I, I'm sure that, is, that made many, many people extremely happy. Mm -hmm. And then that was amended 
to become a sort of a dual understanding of inclusion. We would have inclusion, but also uh, maintain our orthodox understanding of sexual, human sexuality and marriage and so on. And I'm sure you've had, you've gone through your own emotional ride mm -hmm. through those different stages. And now you are sitting here as the moderator of the church. Mm -hmm. How has that been from once thinking of leaving the church to now being moderator of the church and the situation at least about human sexuality being as it is today. Mm -hmm. How has that ride been for you? Well, I'll give you my, my personal response to what happened at the General Assembly that year first, and then I'll say a little more about the longer term. When, when that vote was taken, and that was about the four possible streams that our church might follow, or pathways, that our church might follow in relation to the inclusion of LGBTQI people. I think I was surpr as surprised as anyone else in the room when it was announced that the decision was for full inclusion. Uh, I had not expected that. I had expected that the church would vote for one of the middle ways, uh, and, and so I, I was surprised, I was elated, Tears were streaming down my face when that uh, was announced. Within uh, a day, I think, we had come to the point where the what would go to the presbyteries, what we call remits, uh, which would be what the presbyteries would vote on in relation to that decision, the, the actual wording of what we were agreeing to, uh, allowed for that, what I would say is a compromise or for um, the, the continuation of, a, of, a, of two different understandings around human sexuality, around marriage, around ordination and, and providing for liberty of conscience. I have to say that when that happened, uh, my elation was gone and I was angry. I was absolutely angry. I don't think I can imagine a time in my life when I was more angry than that day uh, because it felt like we had moved from being fully human fully accepted as equal to being back in a position where we were second class. Yes, we were included, but people could say yes or no. It was still kind of a personal decision, a matter of conscience. And I, I was just so angered by that. And there may be people listening who were uh, the recipients of some of my anger that day. And I, I'm, I'm not really, I, I won't say I apologize, but I hope that people realize just how raw that was and what, what kindled that anger. And I've, I've had to sit with that for quite a long time. Mm -hmm. Uh, whether or not to support the remits as they came to the presbytery. Uh, how, how we live in that, in the situation that we're in now. And uh, I've, had to, I've had to come to terms with, with living in that reality. Um, to be reminded again that we're called to love each other, whether we agree with each other or not. And even if we feel that we're being treated uh, badly or in a second class kind of way, 
uh, that we're called to love and to live out the good news that God loves us and loves even those who disagree with us uh, or who we feel fundamentally at some level at least opposed to in, in how we think and live out the gospel. Um, so, again, you asked before about, uh, you know, staying or, or leaving the Presbyterian Church. There was another moment there where I had to say, can I, can I stay, mm. can I be here? And, and I've felt many, many people would have left over the years in many different stages of our discussions and our um, uh, journey around inclusion. Uh, I had to make the decision again to stay and, and to support what the assembly had agreed to, uh, but also to continue in my life and in my words, in my relationships, to proclaim that God is love, love is God, and that we're all children of God and beloved by God. Going back to that early walk mm -hmm. many years mm -hmm. ago. Mm -hmm. um, and then the whole process around being nominated to be moderator came up and I felt incredibly honored that at such an early stage, it felt to me, in, in the new iteration of who we are in, in relation to inclusion and LGBTQI people, that um, you know, a presbytery would consider nominating me to be the moderator. And then I heard and was told that many presbyteries had put my name forward. And again, I felt incredibly honored. And I realized that those nominations were saying something, saying something to me about uh, this continuing call as you uh, articulated it earlier and, and as I understand it in my own life uh, to, to play a role as a leader within our denomination um, and, and to be inclusive and welcoming and to be that even in relation to those who I don't necessarily agree with or who have a different understanding of, of the gospel, again, I would say. Um, and it, it was an interesting calling and interesting to consider being the moderator because in that position you must be uh, in, in some ways a neutral <laughs> moderator. moderator. Of the whole yes, that's why it's called the moderator. And, and to be able to hear and listen to and allow for the, the debate and the discussion from all sides, as long as you know, what's being said is not contrary to the gospel or hateful or harmful to others. And I think we have to remember that, that there are limits in, our, in what we say and what we do. So along those lines, we mentioned earlier, it's been about four or five months now. Mm -hmm. How have you been, how have you been welcomed by the church uh, on your visits and experiences so far. Mm -hmm. How was how, how that experience for you? I would just say warmly welcomed. I, that's, Wonderful. That, that's the first thing I would say. I have been in many different congregations. I've visited a number of presbyteries. Um, I've met with other groups of of folks and have had some ecumenical encounters as well and at every step along the way I've been warmly welcomed. I haven't felt um, excluded or mm. pushed back or uh, that, that there's anything that's been said that I've, I felt like it's harmful or hurtful mm. towards me. Um, but I have felt, I must say, that 
that that welcome has come among those who are generally in agreement with the direction that the church has taken around inclusion. Uh, I, I would welcome conversation with people who aren't in agreement or who have a different understanding than I do. I, I think we still need conversation. We still need dialogue. That's, that's so important to, to us as, as a denomination, and I would rather say as a beloved community, as Martin Luther mm -hmm. King Jr. said, that, that, that we can be together, that we can understand ourselves even with difference to be beloved children of God. When moderators are elected in, in the beginning of their term, uh, they have the prerogative to name certain priorities uh, that, of their choosing, whatever those priorities are. Uh, and it could be one or more than one. Uh, can you share with us what, your, what you have named as your priorities mm -hmm. for your moderatorial mm -hmm. year? Mm -hmm. Well, I have two. And and clearly, the, f the first one that I, I articulated was around uh, continuing to uh, expand the inclusion of LGBTQI people in the church, to live out the recommendations of the Rainbow Communion, uh, to live into the new uh, way that we are church after the remits, and uh, to be a place that's, that's more and more welcoming of all. And perhaps part of that stimulate conversation with those who may not be in agreement. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. The second priority is around our relationship with Indigenous peoples in Canada. <clears throat> and I, I perhaps need to say a little bit more about that. It's certainly been a priority of our denomination for some time. And uh, even before the 1994 uh, a confession that was made to Indigenous people around the role of the Presbyterian Church uh, in the residential schools and also in the larger colonial project uh, that's happened in, in Canada and, and the role of the churches in all of that. But I have my own personal journey around that as well and it's made me come to believe that that needs to be, continue to be a priority for our church, for the Presbyterian Church in Canada. Until we move further along that path towards telling the truth about what has happened and reconciliation, I, I think we're still um, struggling to be the church. And I'll, I'll give a little bit of my personal history around that. I, you mentioned I was a missionary. I was in Mozambique in Southern Africa in the late 1980s and early 1990s, just as uh, apartheid in South Africa was being challenged and, and coming to an end in its in a formal sense. And I, I was very much committed to standing in solidarity with people who were opposing apartheid. And Mozambique was one of the frontline states and had been the victim of a lot of aggression from South Africa because of its particular stand. Um, and, and that's what attracted me and was part of the call to go and be present with, with people in Mozambique at that time. And I had to learn a lot about the colonial project and about what had happened in, in Southern Africa. And I was very knowledgeable about that, I would say, uh, in relation to most other <laughs> people. But then I would come back to Canada and I realized I was coming back at a time when the truth about residential schools was coming to light. So in the early 1990s. And the stories were emerging, some of the cha court challenges were beginning to happen, the churches were uh, 
talking about the possibilities of bankruptcy and and what what this challenge would mean for them. And Canadians were being uh, asked and and people within the church in Canada were being asked to look at their history and their experience of, of being church and of being Canadian in a different way. Um, uh, one experience, I've, I've told a number this story a number of times, but I was in Canada and visiting different churches and speaking about my experience in Mozambique, and the, church, the PCC had brought um, someone who I had met in Brazil when I was doing language study, who was a Mozambican who was studying theology in Brazil, had brought him to Canada. His name is Obedi Baloy. Um, and we were uh, doing our inter mission interpretation together. We were traveling together. We went to my, uh, where I spent my high school years in Sarnia. And I thought it was important for Obedi to, um, as part of that, to see the reserve that's just at the south end of Sarnia. And I, I drove through that reserve uh, every week when I was in high school going to my music lessons south of the city. Um, I, I'm not quite sure why that was such a, a big thing for me to do, but we went together and I realized when I got there, I hadn't a clue about where I was. I didn't know anyone, I didn't know, didn't know where the band office was, I didn't know anything about the people who lived there and what that community was. I had just driven through on the highway every week, back and forth. Um, we found the band office and the, the chief of, of that community welcomed us to come in, sat with us and told us the story about their community, who they were and what their relationship was with the settler community around them in Sarnia. And that day I learned a whole other history of Canada. And I realized I didn't know a lot. And so from that point on, I connected the experience in Southern Africa and what I had learned about the colonial history in Southern Africa with our own Canadian colonial history. And when I came back to, to Canada, I worked with an organization called the Canadian Churches Forum for Global Ministries. And we were working with people who were involved in global mission and ministry from many different Canadian denominations. And in conversation with and in agreement with the the other person who was uh, uh, working on the programs there, we decided that every one of our programs would begin talking about mission in Canada and the relationship with Indigenous people before we talked about what our relation might be and what our work might be elsewhere. So I've, I've carried that through, I hope, and, and I continue to want to live that out for myself and also for our church in the relationship with Indigenous people and particularly as truth-telling continues and with the recovery of graves and Kamloops and elsewhere that, that there's much more that we have to learn and know and recognize in that relationship. In terms of that priority, what kind of uh, events, activities, group meetings um, do, mm -hmm. do you have planned or have you have right. you done those already? Can you share mm -hmm. a little bit about that? I can, yes. So one of the first things that I, I did uh, in late August, early September, I went to Alberta. I was invited by the Presbytery of Calgary MacLeod and then also had an invitation from Edmonton Lakeland. So um, one of the things that they prioritized was a meeting with indigenous people in Calgary at Grace Church. Um, and it was in relation to an overture that had come to the General Assembly about the repatriation of the Manitou Stone, which I knew nothing about, absolutely nothing about, but I read the overture, I recognized what it was. 
and there was this gracious invitation to come and sit with a group of indigenous people, leaders and others, uh, to talk about the Manitou Stone. And I was told that I was welcome to come and sit in the circle as long as I was willing to listen. So I communicated that yes, I'm willing to listen and I hope I lived that out in my participation. Um, and I learned about the Manitou Stone, which is a, a meteor, meteorite. It's the largest intact meteorite that's ever been found in Canada. And it was a place that, uh, that where it landed and the stone itself was a sacred space for indigenous people long before European colonization. It was a place of meeting, a place of peacemaking, a place of uh, reflection, and it was very much connected with the buffalo hunt on the prairies. And uh, the stone was uh, stolen, and that's the language that's used, by a, a Methodist missionary uh, in the late 19th century. Uh, his concern was that uh, it attracted indigenous people too much and away from the missions and the and Christian faith. And so he thought if the stone was in the mission, uh, he would benefit from that as well. So it was taken, it went to that mission, eventually it went to Victoria College in Coburg, Ontario, uh, that then moved to Toronto. And it was, it was an exhibit. It was, it's, it's what we're dealing with now around artifacts that end up in museums and elsewhere. And uh, it, it then went to the ROM, to the Royal Ontario Museum, then it went to the Royal Alberta Museum where it's housed now. Um, and there's been a project that's uh, brought together a number of different indigenous communities, as well as churches, government, um, business, all sorts of folks who've come on board to say, this is a really significant um, part of indigenous heritage and, and, and life now, not just heritage of, of life. It's important that that stone be repatriated, that it be under the stewardship of um, indigenous people again, and that it become again a meeting place for people and a place of reconciliation. So, uh, I mean, I was deeply honored again to be invited into that conversation, to listen, uh, to express the fact that our church had been presented with this opportunity to support the project and that I would continue to advocate that, that we support it. I was able to visit the stone when I went to, to um, Edmonton and to the uh, museum there. And, but what emerged out of that as well was that the stone created in that circle, in that conversation, a place of truth-telling and reconciliation as well. We, we weren't in the presence of the stone, but uh, it had enabled that to happen. And um, it was a very powerful experience for me. Um, uh, and one that kind of set a tone, I hope, for my moderatorial year. I also participated at um, the Church of St. Andrew and St. Paul in Montreal had a uh, truth and reconciliation service uh, on the 30th of September. And I was invited to come and to participate in the service, which I did and said, uh, led in some prayers and was part of a number of acts within that service that, that pointed towards truth telling and reconciliation including listening to the story of a, an indigenous person who was there. Um, and I'm hoping uh, over the course of this year to visit as many of the um, indigenous missions and ministries that we have in the, in the Presbyterian Church. And um, next week, I think it's next week, I'm uh, flying to uh, Winnipeg and going to Beau Sejour to the Sandy Soto Center to attend the meetings of the National Indigenous Ministries Council. Uh, every year, uh, there's usually a, a, traditionally there's a trip that the moderator is involved in. Uh, so can you tell us about what trip is planned for you for this year? Mm -hmm. 
Yes, there was a bit of discussion at the beginning of the year as to where uh, we would go, where I, I guess would go. COVID could have complicated, COVID, potentially complicated yes, things as and, well. Yes, uh, and I'm, I'm very grateful for the fact that at least so far this year, uh, the restrictions haven't been such that I can't mm -hmm. do the travel, but, but we'll see. Um, but um, so there were some different possibilities of visiting partner churches in different parts of the world. Uh, and it was decided that we would um, look to the Presbyterian Church in Taiwan and Taiwan as a place to visit. Um, part of that is that I, I haven't ever been in Asia. <laughs> and uh, for me, it was a, a, an, an interesting and important uh, connection to make uh, as, as a new kind of relationship that I hadn't uh, experienced before. But um, a couple of other things uh, that the, there's a considerable work uh, with indigenous people in Taiwan in the Presbyterian Church in Taiwan. So that was a good connection with, with the priority that I had. And also that there is conversation in the church in Taiwan around inclusion of LGBTQI people, um, more so than maybe in some of the other partner churches that we have, and that there was an opportunity to perhaps have some conversation and, and a reflection on what that has meant for our our church and, and what it might mean there as well, and to hear something of their story. So it seemed a good, a good fit and an interesting fit. And that was before Nancy Pelosi visited Taiwan. So um, it wasn't quite as much in the news. It wasn't as big a, 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 a kind of global story as it's become. And uh, now I would say another piece in all of that is expressing our solidarity with the church in Taiwan as it's under this um, uh, threat and, and pressure from China uh, and uh, for our church to know a little more about that and and to walk with with um, siblings in, in Christ in, in Taiwan. I was also delighted to find out that there's the opportunity to travel with some people and um, hoping that we can pull a group of people together who, who have some interest in all of those areas of their relationship with the church in Taiwan and uh, so that it's not just about me and I know when you were moderator uh, Daniel you you began some of that by taking a group of people with you when you visited Malawi and I, I think that's a great model uh, that it's not just about one person and uh, what we might have to say but all but connecting people and uh, building relationships and uh, and things that might grow into the future around uh, how we collaborate together and how we are God's yeah. people in the world. It, that's certainly true. Uh, having different people uh, in, our, in the, the trip, um, in, in the group, uh, certainly added uh, a richness that wouldn't have otherwise mm -hmm. uh, been able to be experienced. Uh, I, I took uh, two young people and it was just wonderful. It was, it was Mm -hmm. It's a really, really great time. You know, we're dealing with kids as well. So having the young people there was, was really great. Mm -hmm. So Bob, we, we've come about halfway through your moderatorial year. Uh, and this may be a little bit premature to ask. Uh, General Assembly is going to be coming up in June. Mm -hmm. Do you have any ideas at this time about what you would speak on uh, when you are leading worship in, in June? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're not going to hold you to it. Right, right. Mm. Whatever ideas you have so far. Well, let me tell you that, that in some of the preaching I've been doing, and I've been at a number of congregations and anniversary services, um, a common thread through, through those sermons, and they haven't all been the same sermon, but... Uh, it's the new thing that God is doing in the world. And I think we're, we're really challenged by that in our time. It's, it's been there for, for a long time now, but 
Um, I think we're in one of those, you know, we call them Kairos moments, where it's important to discern the new thing that God is doing. We've, we've talked a lot about the end of Christendom, and particularly in uh, Western countries like Canada, um, and, and how the role of the church has tra changed so dramatically over my lifetime, basically, since the 1960s, and that the church no longer has the role that uh, it had and we've had to we've had to mourn that in a certain way, uh, and and we're all feeling the impact of that. And as I travel, I hear so often about congregations that um, are are feeling that they don't have the ability to continue because they don't have enough members, they don't have enough money and resources to maintain their buildings and to to continue in ministry as as they have done over many years and and we do mourn that i mean that's that's been part of who we've been and what our role has been in canadian society and beyond um, but i think it's exciting <laughs> to think about the new thing that god is doing and and what it means for us to be the church in this very changed situation. What it means to be a church that's more at the margins than in the center. What it means to be more like the early church that we read about in the New Testament. Uh, that, that had to discern what it meant to be God's beloved people, the community of God's people, in the midst of empire, in the midst of the institution of slavery in the Roman Empire in the midst of uh, a world where human life was not valued uh, very much. And how to be the church, not from the center of that, but on, on the margins, at, on the sidelines, making a difference in people's lives wherever we might find ourselves. And I, I think we and all of the churches in Canada, it's not just us, we're not unique in that, uh, we're being called into this new way of being the church. And as I listen to people and hear people's stories, there's all sorts of creative um, things that are emerging. I, I love Walter Brueggemann's book about prophetic imagination, and I think that's the kind of place we're in, we're, we're having to imagine who we will be as church and God's people and proclaimers of good news in the world in this very new and different world in which we're living. Um, so be prepared. I think that's uh, something uh, that Sounds I will say. Great. And I'm just going to put a little plug in there for sure. a series of um, meditations, Advent meditations that we're going to record uh, very soon and that will be released in each each Monday of Advent. And I'm going to be in conversation with the leaders of the United Church of Canada and the Anglican Church of Canada and the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Canada. Um, we've encountered each other in various ways and I'm the odd person out because uh, I'm only moderator for a year, so if I don't do it this year, it, it won't happen for me at least. Uh, for the other leaders, they're in their positions for a longer period of time. But we wanted to talk together about some of those challenges and opportunities that face the church in Canada. And so um, I hope people will be able to, to tune into that. There'll be a, a, a video, uh, a YouTube video, uh, released on the Monday, it will be available on all the all the websites of all the national churches, the four national churches, and then there will also be a conversation, a Zoom conversation. You see what we've learned through the pandemic. Who I knew know. that we'd be doing YouTube videos and Zoom conversations? But we are on the Thursdays at seven o'clock Eastern time. Uh, 
uh, with uh, one of the church leaders taking the lead in each one of those conversations, but welcoming questions and participation from anyone who wants to join us, and there'll be a way to sign up on the websites as well. So um, I'd encourage many people to, to come and, and first listen, and then also to join the conversation. Great, great. Well, Bob, I must say you are a blessing to us in the Presbyterian Church in Canada. Uh, you. you are a, a gifted servant of God and you're doing wonderful things. And on behalf of the Presbyterian, all of us Presbyterians mm -hmm. across Canada, thank you for your ministry. Thank you for your service. Thank you for being you. Mm -hmm. And I know that you are extremely busy right now. So I really appreciate this time that you've given uh, to us to have this sit down time uh, to interview you and just as i said in the beginning to get to know the moderator mm -hmm. so thank you bob and thank you. Uh, thank you to all of you who are watching this well god bless you all thank you thanks <laughs>